back to this channel my name is Nosso and in this video today I'll be talking on heart failure because it's one of the key areas that you might likely be tested on for your body exam so without much wasting time we won't be dwelling much on the anatomy we'll just go straight to heart failure properly so what are the causes of heart failure we all know that when the heart is overworking itself which might be due to any of the following possibly uh, when an individual is smoking for so long and now um, the nicotinic acid in the cigarette has lined up the wall of the blood vessel and now it has caused a kind of narrowing which means the blood amount that will be getting to the heart will be so minimal and that will make the heart to be working under pressure like kind of overworking in order to meet the demand of the body so it might not be smoking, it might be excessive consumption of alcohol, it might be uh, increased intake of fatty diet, which now makes the wall of the blood vessel to become um, so narrowed because it would have been lined up with a lot of fat, which will now reduce the flow of blood into getting into the heart. It might also be due to uncontrolled hypertension, which means the blood that is passing through the blood vessels will be going under tension and eventually the amount of blood that will get into the heart will be so low and now in order for the heart to meet the demand of the body the heart will have to be pumping under pressure like kind of under force in order to meet the demand of the head demand of the brain demand of the kidney demand of the lungs all the vital organs we all know that so at the end of the day whatever the cause uh, of heart failure all we know is that the heart has eventually failed and can no longer perform its activity, can no longer perform its function of pumping blood into the vital organs. And now, an individual will now suffer either the left or the right-sided heart failure. So now, let's quickly talk about the signs and symptoms of both the right and the left-sided heart failure. For the purposes of body exam, you don't have to cram all the signs and symptoms once you know the anatomy of how the blood flow into the heart so quickly let's just talk about how blood flows into the heart we all know that for every used blood in the body we have uh, the blood coming from the upper limbs and we have the blood coming from the lower limbs so at the end of the day when all these used blood gets connected from their various uh, veins the one coming from the lower limbs eventually drops its contents into the inferior vena cava, which, are, uh, which is the biggest vein. And for the upper limbs, all the used blood are being collected by the superior vena cava. And at the end of the day, both the superior and the inferior vena cava have to empty their contents into the right atrium. So from the right atrium, it is expected that when there is contraction, the uh, tricuspid valve, or the right atrioventricular valve needs to open and push this blood into the left, um, the, into the right ventricle. And normally, when there is contraction from the right ventricle, it is expected that this blood gets carried by the pulmonary artery. Remember, all artery carries oxygenated blood except for pulmonary arteries, which carry the de uh, deoxygenated blood. So these pulmonary arteries carry this blood to the lungs for oxygenation. But when there is right-sided heart failure, there is problem with the left, uh, with the right ventricle, which makes this blood not to be able to be pumped into the lungs. And at the end of the day, this blood will now back up just on this right side only. And you know, when the blood is uh, doesn't have anywhere to go, it has to go back to where it's coming from. So there's going to be back uh, build up of this blood and eventually goes back into both the superior and inferior vena cava and at the end of the day goes back to where it was originally drained and this will lead to edema so when you are talking of signs and symptoms of right-sided heart failure just consider edema as the major symptoms that you'll be seeing so you'll be seeing facial edema you see both the hands swollen the legs will be swollen the abdomen becomes more swollen you see hepatosplenomegaly you want to see the distension of the jugular veins and this will be the signs and symptoms of the right-sided heart failure so let's quickly go to the left-sided heart failure so talking about the anatomy of how everything goes on the left side we all know that after oxygenation it is expected that this blood from the lungs should be carried by the pulmonary vein empty its content into the left atrium and when there's contraction this blood is supposed to go down into the left ventricle and from there to the aorta for 
uh, and to the general circulation. But when there's left-sided heart failure, that means the blood that's supposed to come from the lungs back into the left side is not able to do this. And there's going to be build up of uh, blood between the lungs and the left side of the heart. So the blood will just become stagnant, become static, and eventually this blood becomes built up in the lungs. And now you'll be seeing signs of pulmonary uh, congestion because the individual will no longer be able to breathe properly from the excessive accumulation of blood in the lungs. So all the symptoms you'll be seeing in left-sided heart failure will be most of pulmonary um, congestion. So the individual might be coughing out and this cough will, have, uh, will contain uh, some, um, some blood stain, which is usually termed pink frottis putu. The individual will be having crackles, of course, because of the excessive accumulation of fluid in the lungs. So when you auscultate the lungs, you'll be uh, hearing crackle sound. This individual, of course, will have shortness of breath because they won't be able to breathe properly from pulmonary congestion. As well, also, you want to see this individual coming up with excessive coughing because they won't have uh, relief, really, like kind of the congestion will make them not to feel comfortable. They want to continuously cough. Then you know that the function of red blood cell in the body is to keep the body warm and, you know, fresh. So when you touch the individual body, their body becomes cold and clammy because the body is not getting this warm red oxygenated blood when it is expected to get it. And this will be the signs and symptoms of both the right and the left-sided heart failure. Now, how do we manage heart failure? This leads us to the management of heart failure. The first thing we can give to this individual, which the board will likely be asking you for, is how do you want to get this individual uh, being relieved from the pulmonary congestion? So we'll be giving our patient uh, diuretics and basically we can use three kinds of diuretics for patients suffering from heart failure. The first category of diuretics that you can use is the loop diuretics. An example of this uh, loop diuretics that the board usually love to ask is frusemide, tosemide and bumetanide. Remember this medication is sulfur based and so any individual that is always reacting to sulfur might not be able to use this medication so just bear that in mind. So, furosemide will help this individual to uh, get rid of all this excess fluid in the body. And, you know, with prolonged use of this medication, they will be having relief from pulmonary congestion. There are some basic things you need to know about loop diuretics. Number one is that at the end of the day, it can cause autostatic hypotension because, you know, they are getting rid of fluid every day, every day, every day. And at the end of the day, they might become so weak. So as a safe nurse, you need to educate your patient that whenever they are getting out of bed, they need to stand up slowly, sit down first, then before they get up. It can as well cause autotoxicity if you are giving them true infusion. So if your patient is complaining of ringing in the ear, that is a good sign of autotoxicity. So you just have to decrease the flow. Also, frusemide can as well cause hypomagnesemia. And it can as well cause hypokalemia. That is, it wastes potassium. And that is why some people call loop diuretics potassium wasters. Because it tends to waste potassium. And you know the benefit of potassium in the heart. If the potassium level goes low, that means the individual might be suffering from cardiac arrhythmia. We all know that the potassium level is usually between 3.5 to 5. So if the, uh, your patient is on uh, frusemide. Please, you need to watch out for signs of uh, hypokalemia. Sometimes some of them present with uh, muscle weakness initially. Then you might be suspecting that possibly this patient has been losing potassium as well as uh, magnesium. They tend to lose magnesium as well. Also, frusemide can predispose your patient to have dehydration, you know, from prolonged um, emptying of their bladder losing fluid so they might become dehydrated so we need to encourage just little quantity of water and as well we have to be doing daily weight um monitoring to see how fast they are losing this fluid because we don't want to load them with excess fluid we are trying to get rid of fluid so we need to monitor their intake and their outputs every day and as well monitor the 
their weight as well. Also, loop diuretics can also predispose your patient to have nephrotoxicity because this medication is so toxic to the uh, kidney. So we need to watch out uh, to do their blood urea nitrogen and creatinine um, on periodic basis. Also, this medication can as well cause um, gout, like uh, uric acid deposition in the joint area. So you need to watch out for this. Also, another group of medication that we can use for people suffering from heart failure is also tyroside group. This is also diuretics. And as well, it also wastes potassium, just as frusemide, uh, leaf diuretics also wastes potassium. So for tyroside examples of medication that the board usually love to ask people, uh, examples include uh, hydrochlorothiazide and uh, clotalidone. So these two medications are usually common in board. So in case you come across them, they belong to thiazide group and they are also diuretics. You can also use it for people suffering from uh, heart failure. But the commonest side effect of it is that it can increase the lipid level, it can increase the glucose level, and it can also increase the calcium level. So you need to watch out for all these. And you know, like we said, that both the loop and the thiazide group, they are potassium wasters. Which means when our patients are on these medications, there's tendency that the potassium level might be decreasing, they might be losing it. So in that situation, the best alternative that we can also provide to them will now be uh, a diuretics that spares potassium. And that leads us to potassium sparing diuretics. The good example of this group of medication is our uh, eplerinone, spirulolactone, or adaptone. So this medication, the patient will be peeing, but at the same time, their potassium level will be well maintained. Now, after using diuretics, you know, we are only trying to get uh, this, our client, out of pulmonary congestion. How do we address heart failure properly? Now, uh, the best group of medication we can use to improve the cardiac activity is our ACE, which is called angiotensin converting enzymes inhibitor. This medication usually helps the patients to reduce the workload of the heart. You know, the heart has been over pumping, over pumping, over pumping in order to meet the demand of the body. So when you put your patient on ACE, it tends to reduce the activity and at the same time tries to dilate the blood vessels so that enough blood can flow through the heart. So a good example of this medication is our Elanapril, our Captopril, our Lysinopril. The surface just ends with pril, and this is a good way to remember this medication. But the danger of this medication sometimes might make your physician want to switch them from this medication. And what are the side effects? Basically, as the name of the group of medication implies, which is ACE, A-C-E, you can as well use that uh, mnemonic for the side effects to watch out for. The A is angioedema. Angioedema is a condition in which both the lips, the mouth, everything becomes so swollen. And you know, when the mouth, the tongue, everything becomes so swollen, that means your patient is not able to take in oxygen, which is another condition. And that means when you are doing prioritization question and you are seeing something like angioedema, you need to quickly pick it as one of your most uh, concerning situation because it will be one of the best priority um, situation to give priority to angioedema because they won't be able to breathe properly. So when your patient is uh, experiencing this, that means they are reacting to the angiotensin converting enzyme. Another one is the C, just as ACE, which means cough. It also predisposes your patient to be coughing excessively. And the E is excessive potassium, which means they will be retaining more of potassium. And we all know the danger of excessive potassium which is hyperkalemia is that it's going to predispose your patient to have cardiac arrhythmias and the most common one the most concerning one is the ventricular fibrillation because you know ventricular fibrillation doesn't have rhyme it doesn't have reading and that is why it happens to be the only uh, cardiac arrhythmia that we give unsynchronized cardiovascular for because no rhyme no reading like you can't just address it because it doesn't have any kind of pattern in so you need to watch out for excessive uh, signs of excessive 
potassium retention when your patient is taking angiotensin converting enzyme. So now, if your patient is experiencing either angioedema, cough, or excessive potassium, what do you want to do? You just want to switch them to a more safer medication. And that leads us to the use of apps, ARBS. And this is our angiotensin receptor blockers. Both the haze and the herbs work similarly, just that the physician a lot of time wants to prefer using the haze. But because of the side effects, they just want to switch them. So the good way to remember this in your exam is instead of ACE, use apps. So example of ACE is our, our cardesatan, vasatan. The suffix just ends with the word satan. So the side effect of this one is very much safer compared to the angiotensin compatible exam. But remember, both the is and the halves, they are teratogenic, which means they cannot be given to pregnant mothers. And the last group of drug I will be talking about is our beta blockers. You can as well use the beta blockers for your patients that are suffering from heart failure. This one will also decrease um, the, the contraction of the heart, like kind of make the heart uh, workload to go so slow, they will reduce the activity. An example of these medications is our propanolol, metropolol. They all ends with the word law. And what you should know about this group of medication is that they can predispose your patient to have bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction. Now, in body exam, if they want to test your knowledge of um, propanol uh, of this group of medication, which is the beta blocker, they can just give you a scenario, a kind of education for further teaching, possibly. Your patient just comes in and unfortunately the, uh, the physician doesn't know that the patient is having an uh, asthma condition, asthmatic condition. And now your patient is suffering from heart failure and the physician is now placing your clients on beta blockers. And you know, asthmatic patients on normal day, they are usually at risk of having bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction. And now they are putting your patients on beta blockers. So you need to pick the safest option because it's education for further teaching. Like this, my patients will not be able to use this medication because he or she is asthmatic, you know? So that is the best way to address the education for further teaching question. Lastly, let's talk about our responsibilities as nurses. Number one, when our patients are on diuretics, we need to educate them that this medication needs to be taken in the morning because when they take it at bedtime, this will disturb their sleep uh, pattern process because they will have to be getting up from sleep to go and be peeing. And you know, this is not too good for the elderlies. Also, when they are taking this medication, we need to educate them that they need to rise up slowly in the morning. They need to get up from their bed, sit down for a few minutes before they stand up in order to prevent them from having orthostatic hypertension that is falling. Also, we want to educate them that on a regular basis, they should get themselves engaged in exercises. We also want to let them know that when they are eating, they should avoid food that contains sodium. We want to tell them not to smoke. We want to tell them not to drink alcohol. And we want to let them know that they need to be checking their weight on everyday basis in order to see how much of fluid that they are losing. And also we want to monitor their intake and their heart rate. And this will be the end of this presentation on heart failure. If you enjoy watching this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And please don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you all. Bye.